Just last month, the Huffington Post published an article titled, Why Do Your Kid's Allergies Mean My Kid Can't Have a Birthday? And while there have been many emotional reactions to Ms. Hoskinson's ridiculous contention that children with food allergies are ruining classroom birthday parties, I'm here to offer a solution to her problem. I say we simply do away with them. And I don't mean do away with the children. I mean do away with the birthday parties. Now, I'm a foodie myself. I love to eat, cook, bake, and Lord knows I love to celebrate my son's birthday. So I understand that I'm attacking a sacred cow here, but stick with me. Let's think about Thanksgiving for a second, that most American of holidays. And I want you to imagine the aromas of your favorite holiday meals filling the house. Can you smell it? Can you see that amazing spread set before you? Now I want you to imagine looking longingly at that table of plenty, just dying to dig in, but you can't because you have a medical condition so severe that your body treats food like a dangerous invader. For all intents and purposes, you are allergic to all foods. Nothing on that table, or any other table for that matter, is safe for you to eat. And if that sounds like science fiction to you, I'm here to rain on your parade and tell you that the disease I just described is an all too real one for a growing number of adults and children. Now imagine back to when you were a child, and instead of picturing yourself surrounded by the understanding and safety of your family at the Thanksgiving table, I'd like you to picture yourself in a classroom, a place where you're supposed to feel a sense of belonging. But instead, you're feeling isolated and excluded because you can't participate in the latest ice cream social that you helped your class earn, or the cupcakes that were brought in to help celebrate a friend's birthday, or the fruit salad geometry lesson that just happens to lead right into snack time, or the green eggs and ham cooking activity that your teacher has planned to close out the lesson plan on Dr. Seuss. Can you imagine how that might feel? I mean, really. How much more are kids gonna learn about Dr. Seuss by cooking green eggs and ham in school? Really. Now, I am admittedly approaching this topic as the parent of a child with life-threatening food allergies and a rare disease that restricts his diet significantly. But I am also a licensed educator and a psychologist. And I have spoken with countless families of children with diabetes, metabolic disorders, celiac disease, kosher children, and children of Jehovah's Witnesses who feel much the same way that families of food allergic children do. Now, many of you are aware of the growing number of children with food allergies, but if you haven't lived it, you may not fully understand it. For parents like us, whose children have life-threatening food allergies, excursions outside the home are a daily exercise in terror. And sending our children to school is even more terrifying. The fact that they will be surrounded by allergens that could kill them is akin to us allowing them to run through a minefield in a war-torn country. And the mere fact that food allergic children are being bullied increasingly with their food allergens makes our kids feel like they're being targeted by a gun-wielding maniac. Now, that sounds a little overly dramatic. That's an actual sentiment that was conveyed to me by a student whose college dorm room, bed pillow, and toothbrush were intentionally laced with peanut powder. Now, life-threatening food allergies aside, few of you could have fathomed an allergic condition that would necessitate such extreme dietary restrictions like the one I had you imagine during the Thanksgiving exercise. What I didn't tell you during that exercise is that while everyone else is gorging themselves on the Thanksgiving feast, you're relegated to slugging back a prescription liquid formula that tastes and smells absolutely awful, but you drink it because it is the only food source that your body can tolerate. So what is it this really we're talking about today? We're actually talking about something called eosinophilic disorders. For those of you who are saying, eo what? Here's a little help, okay? I want you to think of old McDonald. E-I-E-I-O, right? Except we're gonna substitute eosinophil, okay? You ready to sing along with me? Yeah, you knew that was coming, right? Eosinophil, awesome. Thank you for playing along with me. 
okay? Eosinophils are those purple things up there, okay? And they are a white blood cell that's part of a natural immune response to fighting a variety of, of conditions like parasites and infections. But when eosinophils build up in our bloodstream and they migrate to places where they don't belong in high numbers, they can cause any number of variety of inflammatory conditions like asthma attacks, dermatitis, or allergic responses in our gastrointestinal tract. In fact, for patients who suffer from a disease called hyper-eosinophilic syndrome, any part of the body can be a target, including the heart or the brain. What's most important to understand here is that eosinophilic disorders are chronic and they require lifelong management. There is no cure. They also turn on a dime. One day, a patient might feel well enough to go rock climbing, but the next, end up in the hospital with debilitating symptoms. One minute, they're on top of the world. That's my boy right there. And so is this. The next, they're more ill than you can possibly imagine. So why should you care about eosinophilic disorders? Those are things that only happen to other people, right? Sim the answer is simple. They are an imminent threat to you and your loved ones, if not now, then in the near future. Food allergies and eosinophilic disorders are on the rise, and they're not going away. What's more, they don't discriminate. They can attack any person of any race at any age. Some of you may actually already have an eosinophilic disorder and not yet know. Think about that for a second. Today, I'd like to talk about what eosinophilic diseases look like, and I'd like to focus on the most common of these, called eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE for short. With a prevalence approaching near one in every 2,000, eosinophilic disorders are, di are rare, but they are on the rise. EOE is not an easy condition to diagnose. Patients present with a variety of symptoms, including reflux, nausea, vomiting, difficulty swallowing, chest pain, refusal to eat, sleeplessness, fatigue, and poor growth. Many EOE patients also have traditional IgE-mediated food allergies to which they could anaphylax. And while most cases of EOE are related to food ingestion, some EOE cases are actually triggered by environmental or airborne um, allergens. Skin tests and blood tests are only part of the story. And whereas you can see a traditional allergic reaction in a person who ingests a food to which they are allergic, EOE patients must undergo numerous endoscopies and biopsies to obtain a diagnosis and manage their disease. And these biopsies, they can't tell us what the problem is, only that there is a problem. Now, when gastrointestinal specialists perform these endoscopies, they conduct biopsies at a variety of sites looking for the presence and number of eosinophils invading the esophagus. They're also looking for malformations or scarring. Now, scarring is problematic in the esophagus because it is not reversible, and it can lead to food impactions or food getting stuck in the esophagus. Sounds comfortable, right? Now, I'd like you to take a look at two photos of a normal, healthy esophagus. Notice the smooth walls, and the beautiful color. Now I'd like you to compare these to the two photos below, which were taken from the same esophagus just three months later, okay? In the photo on the left, notice the redness and the furrowing or deep lines starting to form in the esophageal wall. And in the right, notice the swelling. Notice the redness and furrowing beginning to develop in this esophagus. And in this one, here, you can see what are called plaques in the esophagus. And here, this esophagus is essentially swelling shut because the tissue is literally being remodeled to form rings of scarring. Now, EOE patients take daily medications, and uh, many of those include steroid treatments. And they also endure an extensive list of food eliminations usually starting with the top eight food allergens, peanuts, tree nuts, milk, egg, fish, shellfish, wheat, and soy. But any food is fair game, particularly if it tests positive in skin tests or blood tests, 
or if the patient exhibits any sort of adverse reaction at all when consuming such a food. A number of patients end up consuming what is called an amino acid-based formula. This is called the elemental diet. Unfortunately, few EOE patients actually enjoy drinking this stuff, and some of them continue to exhibit symptoms even with the elimination of all foods. So they end up on feeding tubes to bypass the esophagus altogether and deliver liquid nutrition directly into the stomach. Some examples are NG tubes, which are inserted through the nose and passed through the esophagus. G tubes, which are surgically placed to allow access to the stomach through the abdomen. And GJ tubes, which allow access to both the stomach and the intestine. Now these children don't need your pity. Pity would just chip away at the strength and courage it takes to live with this disease every day. But what they do need is your compassion. Now here's what drives us crazy. In a society that doles out trophies for mere participation, all in the name of artificially inflating self-esteem, which doesn't work by the way, it seems completely illogical that we as a society would condone the practice of food-based celebrations, activities, and events in our schools when so many children could be harmed physically or emotionally in the process. Now, for those of you who would say that they have to learn sometime, I'm here to tell you that they are learning all the time. Food is an ever-present antagonist in the lives of these children that requires 24-7, 100% management in the home, in the community, and in the lunchroom. Do they really need any more food-based experiences in school to help them learn a lesson in living with their disease? I really don't think so. Those of us who live on planet Eosinophil, we live in a completely different planet than you do. On planet Eosinophil, we spend countless hours developing recipes and cooking foods from scratch with limited ingredients because store-bought, ready-made foods are not possible for our children. We work tirelessly to develop recipes for birthday cakes that are both delicious and safe, and we practice a lot. But for our kids who have just a few or no safe foods at all, they get birthday cakes made out of cotton candy, toys, or anything that will make them smile and feel celebrated. When we go on vacation, we pack foods, medical supplies, and letters from our many doctors to help us get through security lines. Our kids can't go to school, camp, a play date, or a birthday party without having every meal, snack, and beverage carefully planned and packed. Our kids long they yearn to eat the things that other people take for granted. And they learn to feed themselves through a tube. Our kids read books about why their tummies are so different. And their favorite superhero is the Eosinophilic Avenger. On planet Eosinophil, we try our best to make laughter our best medicine. And our planet citizens celebrate each other and the courage and fortitude it takes to live with this disease every single day. On planet Eosinophil, when we hear, they look fine, that makes us cringe. Because while they might look fine on the outside, we know how very, very sick they are on the inside. So what's the answer to this problem? How is it that we can have such supportive families, friends, schools, and communities and yet still have parents like Ms. Hoskinson who write articles that only serve to promote ignorance. How do we help these parents like her who are overburdened by having to accommodate so many children with so many dietary restrictions? I say the answer is simple. We simply stop allowing food-based celebrations, incentives, and activities in our schools. As an educator, I can tell you that these practices are absolutely not essential to the delivery of curriculum. But as a psychologist, I have to tell you that what is essential is for all children to feel safe and valued in our schools. I love and believe in our teachers and schools, but they are unintentionally complicit in the practice of discrimination against children with food-based diseases. And by allowing food-based events in our schools, they are unknowingly aiding, abetting, and perpetrating food-related bullying. 
let's face it, our kids have more than one birthday party, okay? The ones in classrooms are not the only ones. So why can't we come up with a way to celebrate children in school that doesn't involve food? School is not optional, but cupcakes are. We're not asking for allergen-free schools. It's not an allergen-free world. Allergen-free schools would be impossible and ridiculous. Children are entitled to their own lunches and snacks, and by and large, our schools do a great job of keeping our kids safe in the lunchroom. What we are asking for, though, is the compassionate and logical consideration of the needs of all children. And the truth is that in today's world, there is no such thing as a completely safe and inclusive food-based activity. Kristen Shaw, who published a much needed and well-formed response to Ms. Hoskinson's article in the Huffington Post, wrote, and I quote, the only time cake should come before compassion is in the dictionary. And I truly believe that when people are well informed about diseases like EOE, there is no other logical way to think about this problem. So, schools, communities, and parents, you have now been called to action. Will you answer? Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>